we transform renewable energy into hydrogen and hydrogen can be stored on the ground in depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. What happens is that the native microbes transform further this hydrogen into methane, which is very convenient because unlike hydrogen, methane is fully compatible with uh, the current energy grid, with the current energy infrastructure. Do you see the presentation now? Yep, it's working. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so the name doesn't matter for now. I will just jump in directly and try to tell you. So um, the most general idea behind the project that I'm involved in is the fact that um, renewable electricity is something that we are uh, very... <laughs> very strongly looking for forward to and, and a lot of work has been done and the renewable energy generation will be increasing over time rapidly and due to the fact that the renewable energy generation uh, is inherently uh, intermittent so when you have sun you get energy when you have wind you get energy when you don't have that you don't get the energy which means uh, that the generation of uh, renewable energy is really fluctuating this will result, already results, and will result more and more in uh, ever-increasing surpluses of electrical energy generated by re uh, renewables. And the problem with electrical energy is that we cannot really store it in large amounts. We do not have large batteries, and stacking a lot of batteries together is also not a great solution. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the ways to kind of alleviate this uh, is to transform electrical energy uh, into chemical energy, which is called power, to, uh, there is a power to gas uh, keyword for this. Um, in our case, we are using this uh, surplus electrical renewable energy to uh, electrolyze water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Uh, and this hydrogen can then be stored on the ground, which uh, you've heard about hydrogen, I guess, in the relation to uh, the future of decarbonized economy. Um, so this is one part of the story, the hydrogen storage. Uh, we tr transform renewable energy into hydrogen and hydrogen can be stored on the ground in uh, depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. These are porous rock where uh, initially in the first place there was uh, natural gas that we have taken out, we have used it up and now these, um, yeah, these are really natural reservoirs where, in fact, when uh, I am from Austria, but I actually come originally from Russia, and when Austria still buys the gas from Russia, uh, what happens is that this gas is stored in such depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. So this is where the idea comes from, to store the hydrogen down there. Um, but what happens when you, when you pump this hydrogen down on the ground, as you can see on the right-hand side, there's the basically the, uh, the representation of this technology all together. Uh, when you add on top some CO2, and actually CO2 is usually present in uh, the natural gas with which together you put hydrogen uh, down there, what happens is that the native microbes um, would transform further this hydrogen into methane, uh, which is the main constituent of the natural gas which is very convenient because uh, unlike hydrogen, uh, methane as the main constituent of natural gas uh, is fully compatible with uh, the current energy grid, with the current energy infrastructure. And importantly as well, it's um, also, it has higher energy density per molecule. And even though we're talking about hydrogen as the fuel of the future, in some uh, cases such as, for example, steel, uh, steel production, um, it's just not as convenient to use, in fact, because uh, the energy density per unit volume is lower than from methane. And this would um, invoke some challenges, let's say it simply. Um, so this is the overview of the technology. And here, as you can see on the right side, the, the, the idea is further developed into this sustainable carbon cycle idea when... Um, Carbon dioxide is a product, as we know, uh, from many industries and, um, yeah, a very significant product. And the idea is due to the fact that 
for one molecule of methane, to produce one molecule of methane and uh, hydrogen, you also actually need to use up one molecule of CO2, which uh, conveniently creates sort of a closed carbon cycle. Uh, you can burn the same methane that you produced in this way in, you know, in this industry, carbon dioxide, for example, producing industry, such as steel mill production, steel production or cement production. And you can, uh, yeah, establish this sort of closed carbon cycle, which is the aim of the current project that we're uh, working on. And in this respect, I, as a microbiologist or biotechnologist, microbiologist, um, our task is to test the feasibility. Uh, maybe I should, yeah, should have already moved a bit. Um, this is an interesting detail. I, as I said, I work in Austria and uh, this one steel mill plant in a city called Linz produces up to 15% of the carbon uh, emissions of the whole country. Just one such plant. I guess that the, the numbers are maybe not comparable with things in the US or let alone China, but still. Um, the idea is that we can use this, uh, what, I'm, what, what, what we've done in this project, we used this uh, CO2 off gas um, as uh, a substrate for this conversion and tested it in the lab in high pressure reactors. But this glass is not only a CO2 rich gas, it also has carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide happens to also be a substrate for methanogenic microbes that uh, yeah, produce this methane out of uh, hydrogen and either CO2 or carbon monoxide. And what we've tested here is the, here's our kind of experimental setup. On the right hand side, you can see the, the, um, uh, the way our high pressure reactors look like. Up to four bar, 40 bar we can, uh, we can use them, 40 degrees Celsius, which happens to be the um, actual test field um, parameters. And what we did is um, we incubated uh, reservoir brine containing the microbes, the native microbes from the reservoir, and reservoir rock, some drill cores from this same reservoir uh, in these high pressure reactors under, uh, and provided them with, um, there were two phases. In one phase, both of the reactors um, received the same CO2 mixture, a typical mixture containing, uh, uh, containing 2.5% CO2 and 10% uh, hydrogen. The reason for this stoichiometry being that um, for one molecule of methane, you consume four molecules of hydrogen and, as I said, one molecule of CO2. Uh, in, the, in the second phase, the reactors were forked. One, one reactor kept receiving the same treatment, which is just carbon dioxide with hydrogen necessary for this conversion into methane. And the other mixture was, as you can see here, uh, a mixture of a little bit of CO2 and a bit more of carbon monoxide, in fact. And the whole idea is that uh, this mixture represents um, the off gas uh, that comes from, from this steel mill plant. And we wanted to see whether the conversion, oh, yeah, what would be the, the conversion behavior of this mixture. And as we expected, so here on the left side, you can see a pressure development graph. Uh, the reason why we use this is because, uh, as we already, a couple of times I already mentioned, um, we use five moles of gas, four moles of hydrogen, and one mole of CO2 to produce one mole of methane. This conveniently allows us to use uh, the drop of pressure to um, um, follow the conversion process. And uh, theoretically, because of the fact that we have 10% of uh, hydrogen, we will experience a drop of 10%, or in this case, yeah, until 0 0.9, um, if we fully convert our mixtures, which uh, on the left side can be seen. Both reactors, R1 and R2, they're different colors, uh, have converted uh, fully over the course of time. This, is, this graph is a combination of a few cycles that we did of conversion, I think 12 in total. Um, and on the right side, you can see the GC composition just to confirm that uh, all of the all of the substrate gases have been consumed and the product gas methane has been produced. Uh, you can see uh, that both, so there is no carbon monoxide in this case, CO2 and hydrogen start here and here, and then they uh, are fully converted and we have the product. 
So, so far so good as expected. And the second, uh, in second phase, we uh, provided, uh, kept, kept providing the same mixture to one of the reactors, the R1, the green one here, uh, and provided a different mixture, the mixture containing CO, carbon monoxide, uh, to the second reactor. And you can see that the first, uh, just for a comparison, the time scale here is much larger. In the previous graph, you saw it up to seven days. Here it is uh, 20 something, let's say 30 days. Uh, and you can see that the green graph looks exactly like the previous graph, about five, ten, five, six days, you have full conversion. Whereas with uh, reactor two, the conversion is much slower. But it is a full conversion, which is which is what is important in our case. We can see that indeed um, by the end of this experiment, we have full conversion again, uh, carbon carbon monoxide as a substrate and carbon dioxide and hydrogen, all of them meet at zero and methane is produced. So we could confirm that, uh, yeah, by how to say, by technologically, this is a feasible feasible process, albeit uh, slower than the clean CO2 mixture. Uh, another way to look at these is obviously to look at the microbial composition. There is quite an interesting story here because um, as expected at the standard or baseline treatment, CO2 treatment, uh, not much has changed in the community. Whereas in the carbon monoxide treatment, um, we we saw an enrichment in clades uh, within the film uh, Firmicute, uh, specifically genera, Morella, Clostridia, and other genera that are traditionally associated with acetate cycling, which brings us to this um, kind of understanding that, in fact, carbon monoxide might be rather converted into acetate first, and this acetate is just being cycled by... Um, microbes that do, for example, syntrophic acetate oxidation. But I don't know if I if we need to discuss it in such detail. The, the general idea, once again, is that uh, we wanted to test um, a modal gas that, that uh, kind of looks like the off gas that comes from industry and uncleaned uh, gas that contains both carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and that this gas is applicable as a substrate for this geomethanation process. Um, and now we're actually busy with a follow-up project uh, that include investigations at field scale. I'm not sure if we will put a carbon monoxide containing gas, but we will definitely put a CO2 uh, in the field that is coming directly from the this Fustalpine um, steel mill plant. And this is generally what I wanted to share with you, but, uh, you know, on, on the most general scale, there are quite a few, quite a few, I don't know, uh, maybe the right way to say is issues, not problems. Uh, one of it is the, the conversion speed, the conversion speed that I showed you, for example, here, uh, over whatever, five, six days, the full conversion happens. This is not really the case at the field. We have already tested this. In the field, things are much slower and a big challenge is understanding how these things work in the field exactly and why are they slower in the field. And uh, as a maybe, yeah, uh, as we discussed already with a bit with um, Thomas, maybe we can brainstorm how SynBio could be of use for uh, this emerging technology. What may you think about it? And maybe just uh, just for reference, we just uh, luckily and proudly have published in Nature Energy the first, because uh, this was the first ever actually hydrogen storage in, in, in a real test field and geomethanation that we could uh, confirm via some proxy measurements that we actually get this geomethanation in the real field. So if you want to read a little bit more about it, then this is our kind of fundamental background paper on all of it. Thank you, I think, for this from, yeah. Oh, I'm a bit tired. I'm very sorry if I was, if it was hard to follow was, me, but I'm just a bit really tired already. That was fantastic. Thank you questions. so much, Arthur. Uh, it's a fantastic paper. I recommend reading it. I'm currently getting through it right now. It, it's very, it's very interesting. Uh, do we have questions? I, I wrote down uh, some some notes of the stories we talked about. So if anybody has any specific questions, otherwise we could 
go back over some points and see if they generate questions. Uh, one quick question for me, mm -hmm. the, uh, the microbes. So you said in the natural gas reservoir, it's porous rock. And I guess mm -hmm. it's water down there. So in these reactors that you had pictures of, it's a water solution just mixed with the, so the microbes are in the, the, the water. Uh, actually, uh, uh, so we are able to um, get, so you're right. So, so the, the way the, the way the reservoir works is um, the most of it is indeed porous rock that is to a certain extent water saturated. And then there's an aquifer on the bottom. There is a more more, so fully saturated, also porous part at the very bottom. Uh, the gas is stored in this uh, water saturated, but not fully uh, part of the top part of the reservoir, where the, also the microbes are in these sort of biofilms, water films inside of the pores. And um, what we are capable of using in the lab, and this is very lucky, actually not many in the world have this success as well. We actually can get this water directly from the reservoir with the, with the, with the microbes from that reservoir. And not only, we have also the rock from the reservoir. So we are, the mimicking of the reservoir conditions is really, really close. So you have the porous rock as like the media in those reactors? And, and the water, it's also the formation water that comes directly from the reservoir. Okay, very from interesting. From several reservoirs, in fact, we're now completing a study that really compares these uh, sort of potentials between different, um, yeah, rocks and conditions and, and, and brines as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. I, I have a question. Um, how common, like, are they, or is it to find these depleted re reservoirs? <clears throat> like around how common, the world? sorry, what? Uh, these depleted reservoirs like is it the idea is is to use them right but are are these like all around the world if you can find them mm -hmm. yes yeah. uh, in fact before i came to to do this work i did not realize an interesting fact i, I kind of tried to mention this already um you know we are utilizing huge amounts of gas around the world especially industrially and I never thought about this, but actually this gas is not stored in some sort of metal huge tanks. Most of this gas that we use as an energy source um, is stored in such porous reservoirs on the ground. So the natural gas, we already, we already utilize these. Um, so basically a reservoir is, is found. There is some natural gas. Usually in all of those porous rocks, you will always find some of this gas. This gas is uh, taken up, used up. And then that reservoir is very often used as just a storage facility already, but for natural gas mostly. And uh, and this idea that hydrogen can be stored the same way has been around for a while, but we, as I said, <laughs> I don't want to show off or anything, but this was the first time we, uh, uh, it was actually experimentally proven that hydrogen can be stored on the ground because there's a few questions, especially related to the fact that hydrogen is a very small molecule and this, you know, tightness of the reservoir is very important and so on and so on. So we just completed also this study, what was on the last slide. Yes. I don't know if I answered your question sufficiently. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that was good. <clears throat> and in terms of the safety of storing like hydrogen underground, like is it, what are the safety like implications because wouldn't it like are there extra precautions that you'd have to take or absolutely yes this is this is a this is one of the reasons why this geomethanation at all makes sense because uh hydrogen is a bit of a trickier trickier substance to play with in fact because um methane or natural gas is flammable and hydrogen is flammable and explosive and that makes it that makes it a bit yeah much more dangerous. In fact, when we start using hydrogen, I am absolutely sure a lot of things will start happening. People will adjust on the go, let's say. But uh, one important question, um, maybe I shouldn't be saying it in this way, but um, at least one thing that we've done, or my colleagues, the more the engineering colleagues have done, is test um, this reservoir cap rock. So the way this reservoirs 
are organized, as I said, on the very bottom, there's the aquifer, a lot of water in porous rock. Then there is a porous rock with just some sort of water saturation, water films in the pores. And then on the very top, you always need to have a cup rock, just by definition, because this gas needs to be retained somehow. So these cup rocks are um, impermeable by definition to, to methane, otherwise they wouldn't be methane uh, or natural gas um, storage facilities. But for hydrogen, it's, it, it, was always, it was always a question. It's not really, it wasn't so clear. And also part of the things that we've done within the study is to test long-term um, this cup rock exposed to hydrogen and see whether it is, uh, if, if the ceiling is sufficient, or if it's impermeable. And it is the case, at least with the cup rocks that, we, that have been tested, which are related to the geology here, specifically in Austria. I don't know if it works everywhere and whether, whether there's a need to really test every single cup rock. I'm not unfortunately an expert, but the first results are promising. So in this, and uh, in terms of general safety, yes, there is another problem with hydrogen is that there is no regulations. You do not really know what needs to be done because no one knows to which extent hydrogen is really dangerous, in fact, because when you, for example, transport hydrogen on ships, how dangerous is it that hydrogen escapes um, the, the vessels? I've seen a paper, for example, which uh, argues, you know, uh, you've, you've heard that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and you've heard that CH4 is a much more potent C, uh, greenhouse gas. The reason why it is a more, more potent C, uh, greenhouse gas is because it is actually, uh, there is less of it in the atmosphere and, and the uh, the amount that is added increases the, the, the share of methane in the atmosphere much larger. And this is why the potency is higher. It doesn't matter, it's not so important, but what I'm trying to say here is that there is not so much hydrogen in the atmosphere and hydrogen is very reactive. So I do not know how much it will be um, accumulating in the atmosphere when we start using too, a lot of hydrogen in the future. But it may be the case in the future, for example, there is one risk with hydrogen that it becomes a greenhouse gas as well, because what is a greenhouse gas? Greenhouse gas is, is a gas that interferes with all sorts of uh, irradiation that comes from outside to earth and doesn't, and doesn't let this radiation escape. And now there's not much hydrogen and the wavelengths at which it interferes with this escaping radiation, um, yeah, it just goes. But maybe hydrogen does that to some of this radiation when it's more of it. So there's even that kind of risk. There's a lot to a lot to discuss, a lot to figure out about hydrogen, but you have to start somewhere. Wow, I didn't even think about the fact that it could be a greenhouse gas. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, and, and to speak to your question about um, potential scale for this, uh, the paper does have some numbers in it. Um, I think I broke that on another sheet of paper, but I think it was something quoted like several billion cubic meters, like three to three point nine. Uh, yeah, I think I think we use this number in relation to the potential capacity of such reservoirs and how much mm -hmm. yeah how much how much energy can be stored. It definitely is a lot. And yeah, the, the number in, given in the in the paper is 339 billion uh, uh, cubic meters of um, DHRs, so depleted hydrogen reservoirs. Mm -hmm. That's the number given in the, the paper. Mm -hmm. and, and what is the question? Oh no, this was more a comment about scale, about this yeah. this one, like this, like being a very small pilot in comparison to the, the total scale. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. So we, the this, this storage, what, what we attempted to store in the field is about 1 million cubic meters, and of that is only 10% hydrogen, in fact. Um, yeah. So this is just really indeed the pilot scale. And But uh, I, um, there's actually a couple of projects, especially there's one EU project that is going on now, that, that are also going to store some hydrogen. They even did, I think, store the hydrogen. They're now, they're now extracting it and analyzing the data as we speak, really. I think last week they finished this storage cycle. So there's going to be more data on this soon and we'll see where it goes, indeed. And uh, so the paper also says that the, the pilot generated about like one point 
zero eight gigawatt hours. Yeah, That's hours, yeah. per. That would be an annual production. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, it, it did not. We did not generate this. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, or I don't know how to say, unfortunately or not. Currently, we we cannot uh, we cannot really just put it down there and convert it as we do in our reservoirs. We're actually or in our reactors. Actually, we're not sure why exactly it is the case that the field is much slower than than the reactors. We're not making up any data, really. The reactors are super quick, super nice, but the, the field somehow is is um, indeed slower. And 1.08 would be the 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 capacity produced, I think, yearly if yeah, if the technology is you know fundamentally the efficiency is uh, reaches its potential. Yeah, I only bring this up because I was looking and I saw a the largest one of the largest battery storage uh, operations that's being developed is mm -hmm. this like huge mega battery plant mm -hmm. from Tesla and their like optimal like yearly storage would be 1 gigawatt. Mm -hmm. 1 gigawatt. And hour. Talking, exactly. Even and this this is the reason why this geomethanation makes sense or even just hydrogen storage in the first place. Because indeed, the, the hugest battery, the coolest battery, and I cannot start imagining how much that battery will cost as well, because we're talking about economy here. We're talking about energy. We're talking about money, of course. Um, and this small field, this this is a small this this field is so small that it is not used even for this natural gas storage by this operator of gas, which we are, um, yeah, the partners, the RAG, they're called. Uh, they're they're not even using it for gas for normal gas storage, and that capacity would be already as much as as you as you well found and noted the biggest battery that exists. I mean, there there are there are solutions. There's this mechanical. Um, there are very ingenious solutions for energy storage. Actually, very beautiful ones when you use potential energy and then you release the potential energy into kinetic energy. By yeah, anyway. It's a different, completely different discussion. But currently, this is the only real large-scale cross-seasonal storage potential is these underground reservoirs and chemical energy stored in there. Also, that that battery plant from Tesla doesn't exist yet. So ah, it doesn't even exist yet. Okay, doesn't <laughs> exist yet. They've yeah. been talking about it since 2017, and they've gotten a bunch of funding from California. Um, but this scale storage facility has i don't know if they've been broken ground but don't quote me on that mm -hmm. um, any other questions in the uh in the, the peanut gallery another one if no one has some yet um so i was curious about the like the lab scale uh, testing because mm -hmm. often I, one of the challenges i'm aware of is culturing certain microbes in like in the lab and mm -hmm. so did you have any did you notice any differences in the microbial composition of of let's say you know the microbes in the field versus the microbes you cultured in the lab uh that's a really nice question because first of all we're dealing with um really low biomass uh samples so those microbes are not really um, yeah, they're they're adapted to very 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 uh, oligotrophic or very little um, substrate, and so generally working with this is a challenge because if you want to extract DNA, you you deal with very small amounts of DNA to be able to describe these uh, microbes, for example. Um, but it does seem to work. That's what I can say. I don't know. Um, in terms of microbial composition, this brings me to maybe I, I, I wanted to share. I wasn't sure if I should just make so many stories at once, but maybe I can I can show you an interesting story related to this. Another one, which I have here as well. Should I or should I not? I already started. Uh, do you see this? Uh, do you see my <laughs> my thank you? Yes. Yes, okay. So another thing we did is uh, testing. So for this geomethanation, we need hydrogen and we need CO2, right? Uh, there are different microbes in this mixed community. They're not only methanogens. I, I only talked about methanogens, but the same hydrogen and CO2 
uh, are also utilized by microbes called acetogens. And that is not so cool because when you provide hydrogen and, and CO2 and you want CH4 and then other microbes create another product that, I mean, acetate is actually also a useful thing, acetic acid, um, but not in our context. And uh, what may happen apparently is that the community, depending on depending on what we provide and to which extent we, for example, provide the carbon dioxide in this case, um, you can see that the partial pressure of CO2 means like what's the concentration in the end of the day of or yeah part of the CO2 provided. And when we increase to four bars of partial pressure of CO2, we suddenly see a following picture. Um, until we do that, the levels of acetate, which is this uh, product of alternative product of H2 and CO2, uh, the levels of acetate do not really change. But when we increase the partial pressure of CO2 to four, which is which happens here in the phase four on this uh, graph on the right, suddenly uh, we see a huge increase in total acetic acid. So one of the one of the biggest challenges in this case is that we need to be able to control this microbial community and control the microbial composition such that we keep it at um, in in yeah in such a shape that we we select for the methanogenic microbes the ones that that do the job that we want and to select against uh, the ones that we do not want to do stuff such as acetogens there's also sulfate producers that um, feed on hydrogen and yeah this this was maybe the the story ah here we can even oh yeah 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 this is this is the cool story okay well imagine this happens okay this happened we produced a lot of acetate and what do we do now here's on the right side the acetate this is the h2 and co2 that we provide this is what we want the methanogenesis but homocytogenesis is something that happened in the previous slide because we provided too much CO2, this acidified the, the sample, in fact, this decreased the pH, and methanogens do not like decreased pH, whereas acetogens are fine with decreased pH. And this is the reason why we saw increase in acetate, which is here. But what we could do as well, uh, there's so-called acetoclastic methanogens, uh, methanogenesis, uh, an alternative methanogenesis pathway, which utilizes acetate as a substrate, not, not H2 and CO2. And you can see that there's, there's a, there's a cycling. So uh, there's, there's a cycling motion of these, um, yeah, um, chemical substances. And what can be done and what was done, these are details that I don't want to burden you with so much. Uh, the only thing is that maybe syntrophic acetate oxidation keyword is important here uh, because this is the, um, so there's acetoclastic methanogenesis and syntrophic acetate oxidation. Both are done by two different groups of microbes. Both degrade uh, acetate. In one case, it degrades it directly to CH4, and in the other case, it's CH4 and CO2. But this is these are details that know how much you need to know about this. What I want to show you here is another pressure graph um, where we start at high uh, acetate in the beginning of these cycles. We start with high acetate uh, content in these rocks and waters and uh, the microbes. Um, and over the course of a few cycles, we uh, seem to be able to oxidize acetate. And because of the fact that acetate is a, is a dissolved um, component, is yeah liquid component, one could say, um, the pressure graph works the other way around here. So if we... Um, so you, you see a typical, as, as I showed you before, a typical uh, pattern of 10% uh, of hydrogen being consumed in normal methanogenesis. But besides that, additionally, uh, acetate is being oxidized and, and acetate as a liquid substance or a, sorry, dissolved sub substance is then um, transformed into gaseous substance and gaseous substance. And this is why we see at first a decrease that is due to the provided um, gas, gaseous substrate being consumed. But as, as, at the second stage of these cycles, there, these are several different cycles, I think seven of them, um, you, see, you can see the acetate oxidation. So we were able to bring the system basically back into the state of, yeah, clarity or uh, the, not clarity 
cleanliness from acetate. Just to show you how, um, as you mentioned, the microbial community structure and its uh, effect on, on the process, here's one of these effects. This is just one of the stories that happened with them. Uh, so in, yeah, long story short, we had, we had this much millimole and we decreased it uh, this much millimole of acetic acid and we decreased it all the way to this much, which is kind of nothing. Yeah, that's the short story I wanted to share as well. I hope it was not excessive. No, that was a really good answer. I, it was very interesting. I think it sounds like there's a lot of interesting modeling aspects you could do and like optimization. But I guess, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's biotechnology. This is so. the whole story, really. This optimization is everything here. Indeed. Yeah. It's exciting for me because I'm still scouting my master's project out of all of this. So I'm making mm -hmm. notes. Where could we, what could I follow up on? Uh, so it looks like we're coming near the end of our allotted time for the, the meeting. Uh, and since we are doing um, the carbon arc this month, and, we're, and you have some, you've worked with industry and carbon sequestration. So I thought maybe we could have some questions related to doing biotechnology with industrial CO2. So are there any major things that jump out at you when it comes to finding industry partners or utilizing the specific mixtures of gases that come from industry, just mm -hmm. kind of. I would uh, probably it's it's interesting for everyone to share maybe my I, I'm I'm rather new into this applied science so before I started my PhD about two years ago now, and before that I was in completely in basic science so really blue sky science for science knowledge for knowledge. And then only I transitioned into this biotechnology, which is a bit more result oriented situation, right? <clears throat> and of course it was new for me. It's a different, it's a different mindset. It's a different way of uh, people around you looking at things. Even my, even my boss, uh, he is, you know, sometimes I feel, uh, I don't know if you will feel this Thomas uh, at some point, but sometimes I feel like it's more a company than a research group in the sense that I, as the, um, project coordinator for this thing, uh, I have to know every single detail and I need to be able to provide an overview of everything that I'm doing in a very condensed yet um, uh, comprehensible manner such that I do not burden also my boss with the details so that he doesn't, he doesn't have the time to be involved in all of the details that we're doing, all the, all the he is a scientist. He loves the science. We love discussing this. But in the end, at the end of the day, he needs some, uh, yeah, like company-like report type of thing. If that makes sense, it's a bit, it's a bit different to what I'm used to in the past. Uh, and I think uh, this is one part to it. And the other part is indeed the industrial partners, where you just you need to be able to translate your to translate your science into human readable language. Very important. And one cool thing and maybe this this would be the last thing i show you if you want uh, or i won't even show you it doesn't matter there is a technique uh, which is called qpcr some of you may know it it's an it's a molecular biology technique that uh, ultimately results in a measurement uh, a number n a number x a number y let's say in this case we i just i just talked to you about uh, methanogens and the cytogens yeah uh, with this QPCR, we can we can measure the activity of methanogens and acetogens, and this is already a lot of data. This is already scientific data. You guys are barely understanding me, let alone people from the industry. Uh, not because you don't, not because you are not capable of, but because you don't have the right the, all the details and background. And just because of the fact that we need to, to translate this to others, came we came up with a, or an idea came across while we were kind of you know trying to translate this thing. Uh, to pro to use this data of number X that represents methanogenesis metabolism and number Y that represents uh, acetogenesis metabolism that comes from this technique QPCR uh, that we came up with an with a ratio R whatever we can, we didn't we don't even know the name yet we or didn't you know give it the name yet but this ratio R would be the following so uh, if the ratio R increases which is the ratio R is uh, is 
number X methanogens over number Y acetogens. And if this ratio increases, our system is stable, the geomethanation, the efficiency is increasing. But if the number is going down, then acetogenesis is maybe taking over and the system is becoming unstable. And this is perfect uh, perfect to present to these engineering companies. They're like, okay, this, this they understand. And this ability to, um, uh, to translate science into industry language, I think is, is very, very, very important for each of us here. Yeah, this was it. A hundred percent, especially since we are a translational research collective that is 100% our language. Uh, so that's a great message of, if you wanna work with industrial partners, you need to create simple, robust metrics that can be given to them to say, look, here's a, here's a gauge, yeah. it goes up, exactly. good, goes here's down, number. bad. Number is going up, we have a problem. Number is going down, we're good, or something like this. And the, the simpler it is, the simpler, and of course it needs to work. It cannot be just bullshit. <laughs> yes, but if it works and it's simple, then, then you've done your job, more or less. Fantastic. All right, guys, and any other questions? Kind of on a tangent of translation um, and simplified science, but do you think that we could do carbon capture and carbon sequestration in the household? Like, do you think household level sequestration would be possible? It's a it's a question that I like to think as an amateur. I do not know if I can provide an answer as a professional, let's say. Because first of all, I'm not really so up to date with the CCU, all the all of the CCU, even though, of course, as you can see, this carbon usage of carbon from industry is a so a form of CCU. Um, I don't know if it's feasible. I don't know if it's if it will ever become feasible. Household level type of things. I think we need to find a solution of really direct air capture, some some sort of that stuff would should be working but so far actually uh one consortium partner within this project actually they're working on a on a direct air capture um uh, ccu technology and if we are capable of coming up with some sort of general solution of like of that sort i think it's just more feasible on many levels yeah what's the name of the partner Does I, or can you not say is it like Oh, there! I think it's some. I think it's some chemical. Chemical. Uh, basically, they're running the. It's not a membrane. It's more of a. It's it's like a chemical filter type of thing. Oh, okay. So um, it's so it's not like okay. So it's nothing biological. Yeah, because that would be. No, no, it's not biological. It's indeed chemical. Yes, yeah. it's just a chemical filter of specific. Yeah, specific uh, composition that I will not tell you, and I do not know if it's even not an NDA so far still okay but I do right. not know this composition anyway okay. but they have I think they have some some result but you know the biggest problem with again with this translational science with this applied science with technological solutions is of course uh, economical feasibility and this is this is always the biggest challenge and I don't know if even this direct air capture is any any close to economical feasibility I cannot tell you well, I think the yeah, fascinating money, thing about oh, sorry, you you had to oh yeah. I was just saying unfortunately money rules the world yeah <laughs> yeah well I think the fascinating thing about this technology specifically is how many um, different inputs and outputs you could theoretically plug into this since we're talking about inputs being hydrogen and carbon and 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 energy. Um, from that, theoretically, with biotechnology, you should be able to get almost anything out of that with, um, like, if you have, like, if you do, do direct, like, gas fermentation to ethylene or use that to go to, like, commodity chemicals uh, or you have different inputs for the hydrogen or the CO2 capture, it really feels like this sort of reservoir system could be the hub for like a whole decarbonized um, economy. This is this is the, this is indeed how it is viewed within the project by by the people. Yes, 
of course there are a bunch of challenges and they will they will persist for some time but yeah but there this is definitely the the vision indeed that we can we can keep using these underground reservoirs but not for not for natural gas but for yeah for other other forms of chemical fuels which we can it seems to be the case also why this geomethanation you know a common question to this whole story is why don't why don't you stop at the hydrogen storage uh, level of things why do you even you know go on with this carbon uh, sorry uh, with this geomethanation the reason is that um, humanity is really adapted to using natural gas it's it it seems the it, there is a growing understanding that it, there is just no way for us to go back or go so quickly forward past natural gas usage so we need to find some sort of green or sustainable solutions of natural gas and this is one of them this way and then as you said indeed uh there are many inputs possible, as you mentioned already. This, uh, your colleagues from, um, yeah, with the, with the, um, this, this group, you can maybe say, uh, what's it called? The, the, the biomass, the algae biomass producing hydrogen. You can, you can plug any hydrogen in there, or you can, you can, you can put any CO2. If you direct capture, you can put this CO2 in there. And then if, yeah. If you burn it on site and then you put the CO2 back in and then you burn it again, then you are in a zero carbon cycle as we're trying to do. Oh, yeah. It's a beautiful dream. Uh, and I think with that dream, why don't we go ahead and wrap up on that note? Um, guys can keep thinking about this if you want to, what kinds of gases could go in here and then how could we utilize these gases to create a, a more circular economy. So thank you all for coming. This was fantastic. Thank you, thank you to Archer for giving this fantastic talk and for the really, uh, really enlightening talk back at the end. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm excited to hear about what else happens and comes out of, of the company or lab.